Christmas and welcome to Grace United Methodist Church for our online worship. We are glad that you're able to join us for worship today in this way. If it's your first time with us, we especially want to welcome you on this third day of Christmas in this 12-day feast uh, where we celebrate and attend to the good news of Jesus Christ born for us. Welcome one and all. We want to get to know you and make sure that we learn your name and can pray prayers that you carry with you. And the best way for you to do that is by using our Connect card. So at some point during worship today, we want to ask you to fill out that Connect card so that we can learn your name and pray with you. Uh, that's going to be the best way for, for that to happen. It's also the best way for you to make an offering if you're prepared to do so today, whether that's to our general mission and ministry fund, a regular Sunday offering, uh, or if you want to make a, an offering to our, our Christmas offering. I'll say more about that later in worship. Uh, but again, welcome. Pastor Janet is uh, enjoying some rest, uh, some well-deserved rest, and so you're stuck with me today. But I, I know that God will be with us as we worship uh, together. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have poured upon us the new light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light, enkindled in our hearts, may shine forth in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Since we are still in the feast of Christmas, we will sing hymns today uh, that are Christmas carols. But Reverend Milton has arranged for us to sing all of the Christmas carols that we have not yet sung this season. So join with us in this medley of Christmas hymns.
Well, I mentioned uh, that Pastor Jada is away enjoying some well-deserved rest. So is our music associate, Lynn Yost. We hope that you are resting well. Uh, The entire team, worship team, communication team, building team, the entire staff and volunteer team that makes things happen, especially makes Christmas Eve happen, deserve some some well-deserved rest. Uh, I'm so thankful for all the work that went into Christmas Eve. Um, It was a Christmas like no other. But I have heard from you that you were able to worship uh, in all of the different ways that we tried to offer. And we pray that it was a blessing to you uh, and that you got to hear the good news, um, even whether it was in your home or in our parking lot. But I just wanted to offer a big word of thanks to everybody who worked so hard to make um, Christmas of 2020 happen. Thank you and thanks be to God. Before the scripture is read, I want to offer a quick lesson on what Methodists believe about the Bible because it's connected to today's reading. It's particularly visible at Christmas time, actually. What we believe about the Bible is that it is the written word of God. That does not mean that we believe that every word in the Bible was written by God. When we call the Bible the written word of God, we mean that the word of God is written there. The Bible is where the Word of God has been revealed in written form. In the same way, believe it or not, especially since the Reformation, the church has said that the preaching of the church, the proclamation of the gospel in the life of the church, and the preaching of pastors specifically is also the Word of God. In a similar way, it is where the Word of God is spoken, preached. That doesn't mean that every word that comes out of my mouth is God speaking and not me. But nevertheless, it does mean that when I am preaching to you, God is speaking through the words that I say. In both of these, you see, there is a human and divine element. The Bible is written by humans, but through the testimony of these humans, God speaks and is still speaking. The same is true of sermons and the proclamation of the church. There are even a couple Christmas analogies to help us here. The ancient church said the Bible and the preaching of the church are both like the Virgin Mary, a human person through whom the word is brought into the world. The ancient church even said Mary is like the burning bush in Exodus. She is the one aflame but not consumed by the Holy Spirit through whom God speaks. The other Christmas analogy is that of John the Baptist, who we hear from in Advent and at Christmas and soon after Epiphany. The Bible and the church are like John the Baptist because they are not the pure word of God, but they, in a human but inspired way, point to, direct us to the word of God, the true word of God, which is being spoken to us. So is the Bible the word of God? Yes, and are Janet's and my sermons and our shared proclamation as a church of the gospel the word of God? Yes. But we are only called the word of God because we are human vessels through which God speaks the true word. The true word is fully human and fully divine. The Bible is written by humans, but through the testament, excuse me, I already said that. I'm getting excited. The true word of God, as we shall hear today, the true word of God spoken to us, which reveals the identity and work of God in the world, cannot be held in a book no matter how small the print. And it cannot be conveyed in a lifetime's worth of sermons. The only way we have come to know the true word of God is through the word made flesh in Jesus Christ. So that's why I often begin sermons with a particular prayer each time I preach. Have you ever noticed? It's to remind us, to remind me of this word of God which is offered to us when we read the scriptures and when we proclaim the gospel but most fully in the word made flesh in Jesus Christ. So, here's your quick Bible study lesson for the day. When Christians talk about the word of God, this is who we mean. Not what, who. The word of God is a person. And today's reading from the Gospel of John begins by telling us just who he is. So listen for the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. 
What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was born, or because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth, came through Jesus Christ. Not one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Amen. And let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and open our hearts and minds to receive your word this day. Your word, written in the scriptures, your word proclaimed in the church, your word made flesh in Jesus Christ. Amen. Step one, we admitted we are powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. If you know, you know. These are the first two steps in Alcoholics Anonymous. They're worded in past tense because they're a report from the first few dozen alcoholics about their road to recovery, which led to the founding of AA and other 12-step programs. At least once a week, I have a thought that maybe we ought to throw out all our Sunday school curriculum and discipleship materials and replace them all with just these 12 steps. They're not just for alcoholics, you know, they're for everyone. In a normal year, step one could easily be the hardest. Admit that you're powerless and your life is unmanageable. We hate to admit that. But in 2020, it's kind of obvious. <laughs> I find the second step so fascinating, though, belief in a higher power. It follows naturally from the first. Obviously, the addiction is one thing that has power over us, but is there any other power, an even higher power, the second step says there is, there's got to be, or else, referring to step number one, you are powerless and you simply have no hope. Step two is to choose hope and faith, to believe in a higher power, even if you have to fake it at first. I bring this, all this up for two reasons. First, in the church, this is the third day of Christmas, but in the world, this is New Year's week. It's a week when we're all pretty much gluttons, getting our fill of whatever we can and then some, before the new year, new you season begins. It's also the end of 2020 where we've all understandably reached for whatever coping mechanisms we can, healthy or otherwise. So I'd figure I'd put in my plug for considering 12 step as a healthy way for, to walk your way out of 2020 and into recovery. I'm serious. It's as good a time as any. Don't try to keep a lofty New Year's resolution afloat. Just try to take the next step. It works if you work it. The other reason I bring up the steps is because this term in step two, higher power, is the best modern analogy I can come up with for the Greek term logos. That's the Greek word used here in the first chapter of John, which we translate as the word. In modern speech, probably because of the sins of the church, a lot of people have started avoiding the term God. 
in this secular age, we come up with other things to appeal to in order to not have to bring up religion. The universe is one of them. I've heard people manifesting some future by putting it out into the universe. My main question is, aren't you the universe? Like, aren't you part of the universe? Is there something higher or more powerful than the universe? Ancient Israel had different reasons to avoid saying the name of God. There was a tradition that God's proper name, given to Moses at Sinai through the burning bush, that that name was too holy to be spoken by human lips. So they came up with lots of other names, words, to refer to this higher power. One most often used in Proverbs is the word wisdom. Chokmah in Hebrew, Sophia in Greek, Sapientia in Latin. Wisdom, a feminine character in the Hebrew scriptures, is a name for the ordering force behind the the universe. In Greek philosophy, though, a similar concept emerged known as the logos, the logic behind the universe. It literally means word, but it is the same root as the suffix ology, like biology or zoology. These are words about a given subject. Theology is words about God, theos in Greek. But where do words come from? What do the words signify? Where does it all come from? What is the origin of what is revealed in biology or zoology or theology? It is the logos, said, say the Greeks. The word. The logos is what binds the fabric of the universe. The Gospel of John is the latest gospel written, likely around the year 100, when the early Jewish Christians had already dispersed into Gentile territory, Greek-speaking territory, precisely because this is one of the divisions that was reconciled by Christ. And so it's natural that when John sat down to make an account of what had occurred in Jesus, he found himself inspired to record his gospel bridging Hebrew and Greek idioms. John's gospel opens, therefore, with these words. In the beginning was the logos, the word. The binding of the fabric of the universe, the logic behind all things. And the logos was with God. And the logos was God. This worked great for the Greeks because they knew what was meant by the logos, It worked great for the Jews, too, because they had a book that started with those words, in the beginning, in which God creates with a word, let there be light, and there was light. Later, God spoke a word to Moses through the bush, and for generations, God spoke a word through the prophets who said, thus saith the Lord. The God of Israel is a God who is made known through speech, through the word. And so immediately, the reconciliation is happening in how John is beginning the gospel. And for a number of sentences, he writes things that both Greeks and Jews would be hearing for the first time, but that would make sense to both parties. In part, it makes sense because it's using shared, but relatively general, vague, higher power kind of language until until verse 14, when John writes, And the Logos became flesh. Ho Logos sarx agenito, verbum caro factum est. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. By dwelt among us in the flesh, we're not talking beautiful, perfect, living my best life, putting good vibes out into the universe, Instagram us. The word became flesh. It has an earthy, fallen, corrupt connotation in the Greek. What the Logos became was not glamorous or put together. It was human and broken. It was our flesh, real, powerless flesh. The flesh we see in an infant, utterly dependent upon others. Or the flesh I see in our two-year-old and all two-year-olds, walking, talking, occasionally adorable evidence of the doctrine of original sin. It's also the flesh that I see in my own parenting, when I lose my patience, when I fail my kids, when I realize again 
for that or other reasons that I am powerless and my life, especially in this present moment, is unmanageable. That is the flesh. 2020 has had more than enough moments where we're reminded that we are just flesh, powerless, unmanageable. That's step one. Step two, though, is to become open to a higher power to which John says, we got one of those. In the beginning was the higher power. And the higher power was with God. And the higher power was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without this higher power, not one thing came into being. And the higher power became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, full of grace and truth. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. That's how John introduces the gospel in a way that recovering Jews and Gentiles and all flesh can hear it and see him and believe enough to take the next step. Are you looking for a higher power? This, this, this baby in a manger This poor man on a cross, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. This is the higher power, the word of God made flesh, who John points us to, who Philip and Nathaniel followed at the drop of a hat, who turned over tables in the temple and turned water into wine who visited with a despairing senior citizen in the middle of the night and shared a drink with a a divorced immigrant woman in broad daylight. The one who was born, lived, died, and was raised, who even doubting Thomas ended up calling my Lord and my God. This, this is the one whose logic is the real fabric of the universe, who also knit you together in your mother's womb. This is the one who numbers the stars and also knows you by name. This is the one who said, let there be light, and there was light. And this is the one who said, Father, forgive them, and you were. It's hard to find just the right words because this is the word. God has spoken and Christ is the word. He is grace upon grace, spoken, incarnate, taken, blessed, broken, and given for your recovery, your redemption, your resurrection. This is the higher power who meets us at rock bottom, whose grace recovers us. This is the word of God for all the people of God, including you. So thanks be to God and Merry Christmas. Our worship will continue now with a time that we call Living Thanks. It's a time when we give thanks for this good news and we offer ourselves to God. Today, I thought before living thanks that I'd mention the third step in 12 step. It's this one. The third step is we make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we've come to understand him. Whether for the first or 5,000th time on this third day of Christmas, I want to give you a chance to take this third step with me again today. Even before 2021 starts, even while we're still in the midst of 2020, let us make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. If you'd like to do that with me, I invite you to pray with me.
Almighty God, revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ, as the Word of God made flesh, the verbum vivified, the logos literalized, the metaphor materialized, not just a perception or a premonition or even just a promise, but a person. Through Christ's incarnation, you showed up as God with us, like us, for us. Born of a virgin, you are the firstborn of a new creation, and you have reconciled us into a new family, a new kingdom, under a new light, into a new and eternal life. In Christ, your word went out. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Give us rest, dear Lord. Rest and recovery. Recovery and restoration. Restoration and resurrection. Apart from you, we are powerless and our lives are unmanageable without your help. So fill us with faith, dear Lord, that you really are our higher power and that you really can restore our lives. At times, it all can seem too hard and all this stuff about you can seem too good to be true, O oh God. But at other times, I am convinced it is too good not to be true. So by your grace, today and every day, give us the courage to turn our will and our lives over to your care. Receive us and restore us through your word made flesh, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
Love will be our token. Token's what they use in 12 steps sometimes to uh, mark the day that you took those steps. Love will be our token. Among the other 12 steps, there are multiple steps that involve confiding in other people. So I want to invite any of you who maybe took steps one, two, or three today to just let somebody know. That can certainly be one of your pastors. And if today you decided to give your life over to God in Christ, we will want to hear that good news and to pray with you further. But even if it's not one of us, please let somebody know. Connect with someone about this good news. Being with one another as we are in recovery is one of the best ways we can know God with us in the flesh. So our worship now continues with a time of prayer on behalf of not just ourselves, but the church and the whole world. Let us pray. Holy God, heaven and earth are met this day in the newborn child, the Savior of the world. We celebrate his birth, for in him you come to be close to us, that we might be close to you. We give you thanks, O Lord, especially for the birth, life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and all he means to us. We give you thanks, O Lord, for prospects of peace in the world. We give you thanks, O Lord, for confidence in your almighty love. We give you thanks, O Lord, for those who generously give. We give you thanks, O Lord, for those who graciously receive. We give you thanks, O Lord, for your church and its nurturing us in the faith. God of all mercy, as you have come in Jesus Christ to be our guest, inspire our hearts to a hospitality that welcomes you and all your children in his name. Especially, we pray, for those who have not heard your good news. For the sick and the suffering, including Dottie and Gary and Jim and Sparky. We pray for those who know no laughter, only tears. We pray for those who govern and rule. We pray for all prisoners and those enslaved by tyranny. We pray for prisoners of addiction or abuse. We pray for the church as a refuge for the needy. We pray for the needs of this congregation. And we pray for those who have departed this life and those that grieve them. O oh, love, come down at Christmas, down here in the flesh. Restore your people. Fill us with faith, with hope, with love, and make us to overflow with joy. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, our Lord, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as forgiven and reconciled people, in this third day of Christmas, let us sing for joy. Sing we now of Christmas, number 237 in the United Methodist Hymnal. to join us in worship today and we want you we want to encourage you to keep on celebrating Christmas keep keep playing your jingle bells and keep uh, singing Christmas carols all the way through the 12 days of Christmas uh, it is the the most joyous news and so hold on to that joy don't let it go away too fast hold on to it and keep celebrating Christmas we want to support you in that by offering resources so that you can remain engaged with grace one of them is uh, that uh, is that's typical, is not going to happen this week, but we'll be coming back. Our weekly Bible study and our live morning prayer, uh, we're giving some rest to the folks that lead those, but they will both resume next week. Uh, this week, though, we are uh, inviting you to join the Bishop's Daily Prayer Readings. We have a Facebook group that every day publishes a short verse from the Bible. This year, the Bishop is inviting us to read the Bible starting in Genesis all the way through. So you can look for that group on our Facebook page and request to join, or you can email us, office at umcgrace.org, and we'll get you added to that group so that you can read, uh, read the Bible with us from cover to cover this year. I also want to make sure that you're aware about our Christmas offering. Grace has a tradition of taking up a Christmas Eve offering and giving it all away, and the same is true this year. Uh, we just know that this was a different year and want to make sure that you're aware that you can still make that offering if you feel called to do so. This year it's being um, given to three different groups, all of whom are focused on giving kids what they need through school. So first we're going to be supporting the Backpack Snack Attack, 
to get weekend food to kids right in our neighborhood. Second, we are going to be supporting Grace Children's Learning Center, the preschool that uh, is a ministry of our church. We are hoping that your funds will help us make the preschool kid and parent and teacher ready for this summer, hoping that it's safe enough to do so this summer. And finally, to the Hib School in Honduras, uh, a mission partner of ours, their school was gravely affected by hurricanes as well as the coronavirus. So uh, the, your gifts will go to help get their school back up and running with clean water for all the students and teachers. So you can use the Connect card to make that gift. In our online giving, there's a, a pull down where you can designate that gift. Or you're also welcome to send a check uh, with Christmas offering in the note to the church in the mail. Uh, lastly, if you are called to do so, we would really appreciate any end of year giving that you can offer to Grace, to our general mission and ministry fund. That'll help us finish the year strong and begin next year uh, strong as well with, with good confidence. Thank you. Next Sunday, we will still be in Christmas, but we will celebrate Epiphany Sunday. So we will do so Sunday morning at 945 as well as Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. in a drive-in worship service. Because of the weather and the COVID numbers, we're going to worship from our cars, but we want, still want to be able to worship on these grounds. So you're invited to come and join us in worship. You can see the website for more details. Lastly, uh, we are in January going to be starting a new study. I'm going to lead a, a new study called The Future of the Church. 2020 has been a very disruptive year for the church throughout the world, including grace. And uh, so we have an opportunity to think about what is the future of the church in a post-2020 world, to do some strategic thinking about that. But we're going to begin by studying, really, the Bible and the teaching of the church about to try to discover, really, at a basic and most essential level, who are we as the church and what are we called to do? So it's going to be four weeks. You'll be sent some readings to read, and then we'll discuss together. You can find more information in the weekly email and sign yourself up, as well as in the e-newsletter that's coming this week. Uh, but all are invited to be a part of that conversation. Now, receive this final benediction. Go now into the world, walking in the good news of the word made flesh, a higher power, who is made known to us as a person, Jesus Christ the Lord. Go trusting in his grace and following him with joy. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.